and welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, uh, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, to learn more, just visit the website, Pasnia, P-A-Z-N-I-A dot com. Uh, we're getting prepared for spring here at uh, the Free Republic, uh, or as a bunch of seedlings go, uh, seedlings started here inside. Uh, little one had her first baby goat, and uh, the first event, uh, our, spring camp, uh, our spring camping gathering, uh, is right around the corner. Uh, that's March 31st uh, to April 4th. Um, those are the dates. Uh, we do hope to see, we ho- do hope to see any and all vetted self liberators. Uh, it's sure to be an, another incredible uh, get together. And uh, more progress is being made in the digital second realm. Uh, more on that in the coming weeks. But uh, also uh, today, uh, I'm joined by my friend and colleague uh, Matthew Raymer. Uh, Matthew is a software developer and more at uh, Anomalous Design and uh, one of the founders over at ContentSafe.co. Uh, in terms of Vanu, he's a self-liberator who's strategically uh, strategically reloc- uh, relocated uh, to the Philippines from the USSA a number of years ago, but uh, who also carries a vast knowledge uh, and experience base in general. Uh, today we'll get an update on contentsafe.co since it's been uh, way too long. Uh, we'll talk about anomalous design and some of the uh, unique second round proje- projects uh, he and his team have uh, worked on. Uh, worked on. Uh, we'll talk about projects and tech we're both interested in when it comes to the digital second realm. And uh, I'm sure he'll provide us uh, with an update on life in the Philippines and uh, all that he's been up to over the past couple of years. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, without further ado, uh, Matthew, welcome back to the Vani podcast. Uh, how are things going? Hey, man, uh, it's going pretty good. Uh, last year was a really good year. Uh, <clears throat> I've often s- I've said over the last two years that the, one of the best things that ever happened was the pandemic or the scamdemic or the plandemic or whatever uh, moniker you want to use for that. Uh, a lot of business comes in and we, we've been able to associate a lot more with content creators in um, well, mostly in the Liberty community, but uh, we are starting to get some degree of normies uh, that are interested in our products. Uh, I know the, I think the last time we talked, I had called it digital martial law. Oh, excuse me, medical martial law. Medical martial law. And I was right. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, we, we went through, I would say it was about three months of really intense sort of police states actions. And what I found was very revelatory. Uh, in my experience here, you were, you might recall I had said that I had a lot of faith in the locals to be very ungovernable, mm-hmm. and uh, it's a mixed bag. It, it really is a mixed bag. Some of my really close friends turned out to be just horribly compliant. Uh, I have one friend I really respected that to this day he walks around in town and practically in a PPE. He's so afraid. Mm. Um, but, uh, some of my other, uh, acquaintances that really impressed me, uh, there, we have neighbors that even though there were checkpoints at every municipality in the entire country, they went for the entire two years, ran their business and never was, were stopped in doing business the entire time. Yeah. Uh, it was just impressive that s- some people, if you were willing to uh, ignore what was being told to you in media, you could live relatively normal. It was only if you watched and listened and complied to what the media was saying that things really started to get tough. True. So it, so it was great. Uh, I mean, for us, it, it was a great opportunity. For other people, it was misery. Yeah. So that, that, you know, that's, that's for me, as far as personal life here, uh, as far as business, we've really been doing a lot of work with the guys at autonomy. Um, we're pretty much the back office for autonomy now, at least the software development side of, of autonomy and a lot of the more advanced, uh, design stuff, because my lead designer has been with me 20 years. This guy, it's very hard to top this guy. It's really, really, really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've got some jun- I've got some juniors that are coming up as well that are learning from him. 
uh, and on our own, you know, content safe, we were up to about 20 clients. <clears throat> uh, I've really had a struggle with the infrastructure of the software. The, the first version that I had written, I pretty much outsourced the first version. And I just told a developer how I wanted it to be written. And what I found was that it didn't scale well. Uh, it it did what it was it did what it needed to do if you only had a handful of clients, but once you started getting above ten clients, it was very very finicky. It would fail frequently. So mm. I, I believe it was July of uh, July of twenty twenty. I just decided I would rewrite the whole thing myself, and I came up with a different infrastructure that was very lightweight, uh, very easy to scale. And I've been, re I've been building on that since July of 2020. And now it supports, I believe we're up to 60 different services that it uses internally. And we support like every major al alternative platform now. We, we yeah, support so Odyssey. Yeah, so, uh, so before before we get too far into this, um, we do have, uh, you know, you're t talking mm -hmm. about uh, opportunities and all. Well, there's been, you know, new folks to the realm of self-liberation. So for those mm -hmm. who don't know about Content Safe, uh, if Content Safe, could you kind of lay out an, an overview of what you guys do? Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, content Safe is a content redistribution service. So we knew that uh, everyone was going to be migrating out of YouTube. And that's that's come true. And you've got all these alternative platforms that they would want to go to, and who knows which one is going to come out on top. There are over two dozen video platforms now. Uh, and what we provide is a, a, a means of moving video from one place to another. And we've tried to do this in such a way that we didn't really pick any particular platform as our source. So we can pull from YouTube, we can pull from BitChute, we can pull from Odyssey, we can pull from Rockfin, uh, we can pull from Float. We've got it every place that we can upload to, we can also download from. And I'm also in the process of doing uh, monitoring services. That, that's, this is not quite ready yet, but I want to be able to monitor subscribers and view counts on all videos and then mm. be able to provide a dashboard to my clients so that they can track how their videos are performing across all the different platforms. So that's, that's content sale. Gotcha. Okay. Nice. So yeah, you've been, you've been, you've, yeah, you've been, uh, uh, you've been busy, <laughs> uh, to, to put it mildly. Huh? Oh, uh, that's only part of what I've been involved in. <laughs> yeah. I, I also have, I'm preparing to launch a first realm, uh, service. Uh, it's a, um, uh, a mechanic, uh, and auto owner matching service. So we provide escrow services to mechanics and automobile owners so that they can find a mechanic in their local area. Hmm. And it's called mechanic mobile. Uh, we're preparing our advertising copy right now. It it really took us a little longer than I thought it would uh, as all startups. they You get an idea and you're like, oh, we can get that done in six months and two years go by and you still haven't launched. Uh, well, we're, we're actually launching uh, probably next week and uh, we've already got a, a test bid. So that that's something that I want to look into moving that into the third realm that I want first part is to get it operational in the first realm. But I, I really think that getting something like that in the third realm would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, as I see it uh, with all of the restrictions and regulatory things that seem to be pretty much inevitable, uh, getting the means of making a living and getting services that you don't have to use the fiat system would be ideal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, I want to give you a chance, man, to talk more about anomalous design. Cause I, I, I heard you on tinfoil hat 
Sure. Um, I guess it would have been a, f- a few months back, and you're talking about oh. I guess some of your interesting, some of the interesting projects you've, you know, like uh, you've, I mean, you've 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 been in the, uh, and I guess it might be interesting to talk, like to men- mention a little bit about your history on the internet too, because I I hadn't really heard, I guess I I didn't, I guess I knew, but I didn't really know. Oh sure. Um and uh, yeah, some of the well, some of the some of the interesting interesting projects you've been been involved with and. Um, cause I, cause I, I it's, it's important, well, sure. it's, it's important because, uh, there's a guy that's, uh, um, that paid me for some consulting and, uh, he was, uh, it was uh, the, the project, he, he, he went a different, a different direction with the project, but it was something with like this decentralized autonomous organizations. And, um, like, obviously I was like, well, well, Matthew would be a good one to talk to you about this. Um, so for like a lot of these interesting second realm, like digital second realm projects, um, you know, like you and Anomalous Design are a perfect fit for that. Sure. So, um, yeah, tell us a bit about yeah your history on well, the sure. and some of your projects, um, et cetera. Well, you know, uh, let me try to thumbnail my ancient history. Uh, do some archaeology here for a minute. Uh, I got into computers when I was 13. That was like 1983. I actually had a little bit of exposure uh, the school system I was in was uh, remarkably advanced for the 1980s, uh, 1980s, 1970s. Even we already had terminals in our elementary school, so uh, we were a bit ahead of the curve. And I was really passionate about uh, actually I was passionate about three things in elementary and middle school and high school, and that was music. I wanted to be a musician. And, and I also wanted to be a scientist, and I also wanted to be a programmer. <laughs> so it, it, it all kind of collided with me. In 83, my dad bought my first computer. Uh, I actually started a company in 85. Uh, we were writing early bulletin board. This is pre-internet communications bulletin board software, <laughs> which we were trying to market. Uh, I mean, but you know, it's funny because I was heavy into the BBS community whenever I was, say, 14 or 15 years old. And uh, it, it was, you know, funny to me to watch the internet grow over the years because, in, a, in many ways, it's still very similar to the way it was in the 1980s. It's just bigger and it, there's more people involved. So we get past that, and I got interested in physics. And as I said, I I really couldn't make up my mind, so I triple majored in university, uh, physics, computer science, and math. And I was set, I'm actually published in computational biophysics, but I went to graduate school for physics and I was gonna specialize in computational solid state. And, you know, once you get into the scientific establishment, uh, and I was, it was pretty heavy, I'm published. And I, I knew a lot of very, very, very smart people. And I just became very disenchanted with that world. Uh, I often call academia macadamia because they're mostly nuts. Hmm. Uh, so I had this opportunity to leave physics graduate school and I, I just decided I'd fast track out to a master's in computer science because computer science is a hell of a lot easier than physics. So, uh, and I was, I was summa cum laude graduate and, you know, all of that normie sort of credential stuff. I had all that. Uh, I met a friend of mine uh, at that time. And he had married a Filipina and I got a pen pal. And so that's how I met my wife. That's how I ended up in the Philippines. Uh, And early on, we were trying to, uh, we just kicked around for about three or four years and just lived off friends and family for a while. And I got involved back into the early internet in Southeast Asia. I partnered with a fairly influential uh. Filipino businessman. Uh, We were not able to make the business go. We were about four years too early. (laughs) Uh, No one wanted to accept our ideas. And four years later, everybody wanted what we were offering four years Mm -hmm. before. Well, you know, that's often uh, Asian markets are very conservative. They're slow adopters. And that's something I didn't know at the time. Well, I I decided to get out of that and go back into consulting. And whenever I got into consulting, uh, I had friends, classmates that 
had, were already in their careers. This was in the early 2000s. And I was able to snag a few good contracts because of friends. And that got me uh, into uh, writing basically what would be corporate intelligence systems. And at the same time, it got I was interested in distributed technologies. So I was involved with BitTorrent and things like that back in the early 2000s. Uh, so I knew about this stuff, and I knew the power and potential of it. So as the end of the 2010s came in, I got really interested in cryptocurrencies because there's a very clear connection between BitTorrent and Bitcoin. Uh, at least as far as the network layer, they're very similar to one another. Mm -hmm. uh, the, of course, not the cryptography part, but just the network communications, the distributed nature of it. So that that really set me in the direction of uh, information independence. And at the same time, I kind of had, because my dad was an old school conspiracy theorist. I mean, like, Kennedy era sort of conspiracy theorist. Hmm. And he tried to convince me about all this stuff over, you know, my childhood. And I was always like, nah, dad, you know, I don't, I don't believe that. You know? Well, about 2010, I started watching YouTube. <laughs> I had put off watching YouTube because I knew me. Uh, I'm definitely OCD. So if I get into something, I get into it in a big way and I don't, yep. and it blocks everything else out in my life. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. but I mean, I got into it and then that's how I met, uh, uh, you know, people like Mark Passio and yourself and Richard Grove. And, uh, I had this initial passion to, uh, for, uh, anarchy and, uh, and developing communities and combining that with technology and i guess you could say the rest is history because content safe came out of that uh you know other side little projects that we've talked about have come out of it um and i'm always looking for another interesting project you know one thing in the last five years is that we have uh focused on uh social networks I was predicting, uh, and I've done some plans for some clients in Europe about this. <clears throat> I actually had a massive plan for a guy in the European football industry for building a social network for football players. And we, of course, for Americans out there, that's soccer. Uh, I believe that the future of social networks are niche markets, not massive, uh, all-purpose uh, social network platforms. So I, I don't really see uh, something like Facebook or Twitter being able to survive the at the size that they're currently at. I, I think that Facebook will inevitably become something like MySpace. That sounds shocking, but I, I think the handwriting's on the wall. What's going to come out of this are specialized platforms around geographical regions, spe uh, technical special, you know, specialities. Uh, these are more practical. And the reason is that every particular space has its own set of unique functions or actions that, that it needs to perform. So taking the football industry, for instance, uh, the guy that I was helping with the plan uh, was pointing out how most of the football industry, and it's probably still true, uh, used LinkedIn. And that LinkedIn was great for connecting to people, but it didn't provide a means for handling all of the legal and business matters that come with the football industry. So sure. I see this as a great insertion point, right, for – uh, the Liberty Anarchy communities, uh, these voluntarist communities, we need to be building tools that aren't general purpose. We need to be building tools that are specific to our communities. That's my two cents worth anyway. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting. So I, I guess a question comes to mind more kind of in your history, just out of my curiosity, going back into I guess libertarian and in this case like cy- cypherpunk history. You've been on the internet for a long time, and I guess bit sure. the early two thousands. Uh, yes. Were you in those early any of those early I guess yes. cypherpunk you know um, newsletters or anything? Did you ever come across those? Uh, no, I, I I didn't get into too much of the. You mean like fracking or freaking or, you know, the, the telephony stuff? Um, I, I didn't not, get into too much of that. though. Not necessarily, just the, I guess, the cypherpunk, um, I guess the cypherpunk email newsletters back then, I guess the, the correspondences. No, no, I, I didn't really get into that, no, okay. no. Uh, but I did read, uh, I, I, you know, I do remember from the mid-90s reading The Great Hacker Crackdown. Are you familiar with that work? I'm not. No, no. Uh, let me let me find it here real quick. Um, this is a very interesting work because it it talks about how the banking industry in the 1980s was very vulnerable. Ah, uh, yeah, it was the hack the hacker crackdown. It was published in '92. And it reveals how banks were regularly paying off hackers who had cracked their their banking systems. Sometimes to the tune of a hundred thousand dollars to get the hacker to go away. Hmm. Now, it was by Bruce Sterling, um, who's pretty popular in that genre. Now, what I found interesting. I, I love anecdotes, okay? Uh, a lot of people don't like anecdotes. They, they like, quote-unquote, evidence. Hmm. But to me, anecdotes say quite a bit about what the reality is in the world. Uh, whereas documenting something, you'll, you'll very rarely get someone to go on the record to say things like, I hear one of my cousins, a lot of my family is in IT, by the way. Uh, one of my cousins was in the insurance industry. He's, he was in it like at, for IT. He's been in the insurance industry since the, ni- the late 1970s. I was, having a, I was at a family reunion before I migrated here. And I knew a little bit about cybersecurity at the time because that was like, not even really internet yet, but in fact, I think we were still doing dial-up whenever I had this conversation. This guy, I ask him, so wh- whenever you guys have your CPU, your, your, your data center set up, do you password or, or provide some sort of security to your dial-in lines? And he laughed. He said, no, why would we want to do that? Hmm. So This guy was admitting to me that a major insurance company had no security on its computer systems. Yeah. Uh, Well, you know, uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, I've kind of built my worldview around. Now, if you get me over here, if you get me over here in Southeast Asia, you can really meet some very interesting people here. <laughs> uh, a lot of these guys are retired military. And you could sit over coffee and hear some of the craziest stories about what these guys have seen. Uh, one guy, uh, he's, he died uh, early 2021. Um, he, I think he was one of the first responders in the U S for the telco industry. And he was installing 5g towers all over the U S but the guy used to live here and he migrated back, uh, quote unquote, to get his kids a better education. If that's possible in the U S, uh, this guy was t- over coffee talking to me about, uh, you know, what was it? Um, the guy that Richard Grove interviewed, um, was that Bennett? Benny? Well, who was it? Uh, the the, the Benny. NSA. Benny, Benny, yeah. Benny. Yeah. And I didn't know, because this was before I met Richard. 
I was uh, having coffee with this guy and he's like, yeah, you read about that, uh, that uh, room in LA that the NSA copies all the data. This is uh, prism. I think is what the project was called. Mm -hmm. And cause it had been published. Right. It's like, yeah, <laughs> I've been to the room. He said, it's not a lie. It's true. Yeah. And at the time I was like, oh, I didn't have any clue what he was talking about actually at the mm -hmm. time, but now I know. So anecdotes are important. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Sean. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wandering off into the weeds. No, that's Pull that's me back okay. into the trail. <laughs> no, that's, that's okay. I appreciate it. No, I, I, I definitely appreciate it. Um, but uh, I guess uh, what what I'm I guess I'm, I'm curious about. Uh, um, I think you mentioned it just just a moment ago in regards to content safe. But uh, are you guys working on like IPFS integrations mm -hmm. and um I, in that regard? Oh yes, because I I, yes. I see a lot of potential in IPFS in a big way. and like I guess Odyssey in general. I'm not sure if we could um, I guess talk a little bit about um I guess oh, sure. integrations with IPFS and Odyssey and and what what you see as I guess sure. the vision of those of those platforms and their uses. Something like IPFS, maybe not IPFS itself, but definitely something like IPFS is the future. The way I see it is that it's, even though it's not really new technology, I mean, IPFS is just a reformulation of BitTorrent. Uh, a, a better formulation of BitTorrent, but a reformulation of BitTorrent. I see as our problem, as always, is adoption. Adoption is the issue. Getting people to feel comfortable with using the technology. Now, we come really, we can, man, things have improved so much on the IPFS front. I don't know, did you know that uh, Cloudflare adopted IPFS as, a, as another channel really? in their network? Yeah, I did not know that. So you've got you've got a gateway through IPFS, you've got a gateway through Infura, and you've got a gateway through Cloudflare now. So if you're looking out, say in the in the uh, dark web, so to speak, dark web, all of the stuff that you could you would have needed, say a a website in Russia or a website in Taiwan to get before. Now it's all available on IPFS. So have you heard of Libgen? It sounds familiar. Um, it sounds familiar. I think I have. Libgen is a, is it, it, I think it's actually Russian based, but the, the website is libgen.is. It's an Iceland uh, domain. This provides like 20 million books. Well, they originally were only available for download on websites or via BitTorrent. But now the entire catalog is available on IPFS. Yeah. So for content creators, this is where everyone needs to be at. So what we're trying to do is provide, at least in the short term, cloud-based servers that we could use to help seed or pin in IPFS terminology, mm -hmm. pin materials for content uh, creators. We, we've launched this as a, as a service. Uh, I've got two clients that we're currently doing it for um, that we can upload their videos and thumbnails and we're going to be providing I, uh, HTML files on IPFS so that their entire catalog can be placed on IPFS. And then we provide pinning services to make those accessible. And uh, so that's been pretty successful too. Uh, I've got a fairly low cost uh, hosting company I use. It's not a mainstream hosting company. Um, and their servers are pretty dark. Uh, so I feel, I, I wouldn't want to put all my weight on that. I'm also going to be developing some in-house stuff. But the next step after.
after these cloud-based servers are things like Ernest Hancock's Pirate Box. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where we need to go to. We need to be going to the Pirate Box. Now, as far as Odyssey, I think Odyssey, I would say in terms of non-YouTube alternatives, Odyssey is probably right up there with BitChute. Uh, in terms of viewership, I'm not so sure. I think BitChute still leads them on viewership. But Odyssey definitely has a great product. But what we should be doing is looking at them as intermediate steps toward better solutions. Right. Uh, what I would like to see is a, to a totally distributed a uh, social network and video platform that uses IPFS and doesn't have any servers at all. I, I've actually talked to the C, the, see, the COO of Float. Um, I've forgotten the guy's last name, Alex something. Alex, let's see, I have his whole name here. And, and I think that the, the guys at Float it, they they're on the same page. I, I think that they want to move that direction. Uh, Alex Martin at Float. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. Have you met Aaron and Kingsley? Um, I've I've been uh, I guess just associated digitally with them for a number of years. Um, I know they're good people, but I I've never um, talked to them or anything. No. Well, I think that they their hearts are in the right place. They've got a good they've got a good idea, and they're just struggling to get all the implementation stuff done. Uh, but they're co very conscious of the, the problems that face uh, platforms like themselves, which they can be easily removed or hacked. Where That's why we need to be moving this out into a, a decentralized space. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm still, I'm still very much, uh, I would say enamored with um, the patchwork network, you know, the rumors sort of protocol. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking uh, this uh, scuttlebutt back towards that kind of, that kind of protocol. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason I like that, it, it's not, it, I mean, it's got issues, but it's ultimately flexible. So if I want to create a private subnet, no problem. If I want to move, if I want to work offline and then only have occasional access to the gr the greater net, that's fine. Uh, I think that in terms of voluntarist communities, that scuttlebutt's actually the way to go. But in terms of mass, large scale sites, IPFS is the way to go. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it. Uh, and I'm going to be definitely. putting a lot more energy into IP, IPFS. I, I'll be putting a lot of energy into IPFS. Yeah. Right now, we back up. Uh, we, we're actually taking Ernest Hancock's show and moving it to float presently. Uh, he publishes the IPFS, but he wants to be able to distribute to other platforms. So we're, we're doing that for him now. Mm -hmm. Uh. And again, you know, the, the problem as I see it is it, it's all infrastructure. So if you don't got people pinning, then you're going to have issues. So I, I think that um, in addition to getting people to adopt it, we need to get them to be willing to use their resources to help the network grow. So what I've been proposing to to my clients is that they look into what's called IPFS cluster. Have you heard of that? Um, I have not heard of IPF cl IPFS cluster and, and uh, specifically, but um, that's it's, this is this is fantastic. I'm glad we're I'm glad we're talking about this because um, I, I that's kind of the direction I've been going is is, is infrastructure with uh, ghost phones in particular now. Um, do googled uh, Pixel three A's mm -hmm. with Calyx OS on them. Um, but been working with Jamie and Bacon, kind of getting those yeah. out to people. Um, and then obviously the ghost pads too, the, uh, the firmware hardened, uh, Lenovo ThinkPads. And he's got a couple other models that he, that he's been, been working on too. 
Um, but basically, yeah, owning the infrastructure and uh, um, and and infrastructure, infrastructure right. that's not spying on you. Um, so the, there's another, I guess, another version. Right. I think the pirate box uh, mm-hmm. is probably similar to the freedom box thing that we're kind of working on too. Um, so yeah, it's it's great to see all these things kind of uh, converging and and yeah, I think like it's it's also like also too. Um, you're contributing to the infrastructure. Um, so running, you know, Bitcoin full nodes and running, you know, IPFS, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the ter- the correct terminology is, um, you know, pinning, pinning things. Um, I think that's important. And what I really like about the ghost phones is that, uh, um, yeah, obviously li- the library app is on there and I should do, I should do more with IPFS specifically, mm-hmm. but I, l- I just let library run in the background. Um, so, um, well, library is great. And, yeah, the library is great, and I am. My opinion is the more the merrier. That we just need to have a lot of people involved right. in this. And I, you remember early on when we first were talking to one another, I I had brought up like a couple other texts that I thought had promise. They are just not as well known. Uh, I, there's one that's Python based and I cannot remember the name of it off the top of my head. It was another Bitcoin sort of BitTorrent tie up. Uh, there's also uh, messaging protocols like BitMessage that I think we should be keeping a very close eye on. Uh, do you remember BitMessage? Yes, I remember BitMessage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do. You know, it was quite controversial there at the beginning, but I think that they actually, that they made a sensible decision. Their problem was that they were trying to use the technology in a way that was going to make it vulnerable. So they were trying to make like public uh, bulletin, li- uh, public, uh, you know, lists or public posting. It, BitMessage is not the right technology for that. It, it was getting flooded with spam and it was, it was just a mess. Well, I think new, the new developers took over and they focused on individual private communication. That's where a uh, technology like BitMessage really shines. And BitMessage, uh, there's another one that's called Twister or Twisted. Uh, it's a Twitter replacement that uses a Bitcoin type address uh, s- scheme, and it also uses proof of work to try to prevent spamming. NFT. And yeah. then Remember it uses a BitTorrent you, type network to. Uh, yeah, that was done by a guy in Brazil, uh, and I think it's still a good idea. Uh, and so, on top of things like IPFS and library, we need to have these other types of technologies that continue to grow and what we'll probably find is that they'll merge that that would be my suspicion you'll find that uh, that those types of technologies will ultimately merge it's not that they will replace or one will come out dominant uh and the reason that i like the diversity is because it makes it harder to control right Mm -hmm. True. If you've got things, if you got data coming in lots of different angles and in different communities, it makes it much harder to control. And censorship is our biggest enemy right now. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. And I guess I, I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on this too. Just, uh, um, uh, and and another idea that's that's been that's been tossed around is um i guess like a distributed distributed um and like i guess you, you like it doesn't have to be like data centers even because like it just has to be a, like a, a server or whatever it doesn't have to be that much but um like uh, various um you know distributed um you know servers um you know all over the world where we could have like a private kind of trusted uh vpn setup where we could have like three or four hot vpns um, cause I use, I use Proton VPN now and it's a two hop, I, I pay for their two hop service, but there's not really, um, now that crypto hippie Paul Rosenberg service is down, um, where they, they closed their, you know, they, they, they're now not defunct. They closed their doors, uh, this, uh, earlier this year. Um, there's not really like a multi, multi hop VPN, um, that I'm aware of. So, um, that'd be a pretty cool, um, pretty, mm-hmm. uh, pretty cool thing. So I, I, I don't know. What are your, what are your thoughts on, on something like that? 
I, I think that we have been providing VPN services to some of our clients for like three years, and we we always set up our own uh, VPNs. We don't we don't use third party VPNs. So uh, I think a multi hop would be great. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't mind uh, putting together a network like that. <laughs> okay, well that's uh, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, that's uh, um, yeah, that's that's good to hear. So it's already being done, I guess per se. Then, um, so um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. yeah. uh, that's good to hear. So um, I guess um. I'm trying to think if there's anything else uh, in particular on um well I guess a, 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 an important question I think one what we've we kind of been talking about it um a little bit so far but um to to give people you know concrete things that they can do how can they can how, how can they contribute to the IPFS network um like uh, what's uh, you know a, a piece of hardware or something they can get uh, maybe an old laptop and and how do they start pinning how do they start uh, you That's know, right. um seeding uh, you know, one thing that's one thing that you could do <clears throat> is just get, like you said, an old laptop. Uh, I would suggest use Arch Linux. I, I've switched. I don't use Ubuntu uh, anymore. Arch Linux looks like a really nice, a viable alternative. But though my company is experimenting with cubes, by the way, I don't know if you know cubes. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got a cubes system, like a 64 gig server set up uh, in our office in Kentucky that we're playing around with. Uh, but uh, set up a Docker-based IPFS node. Now, what's nice about IPFS is it could sit there passively, and it will actually be helping the network, even if it's passive. Even if you haven't pinned anything, it's being utilized to help seed the network. But if you want to help a specific content creator, you need to get the IPFS CID for the file that you want to pin. And then you pin that in your IPFS node and it will stay on your system permanently as long as it's pinned. And that will help, that will help distribute uh, that content you know, like one thing I've thought about is, uh, you know, we maintain for you all of your files, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. We could actually, we could actually copy all those over to our uh, IPFS node because we keep one server that's just ours. We pin uh, like we've got some people like yourself that we have special arrangements for. We would be able to pin all of those files on that server and then we could provide all the hashes for all those files and then maybe you could update uh in your wordpress site the hash to that file so you've got both you've got a conventional uh um uh, 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 file share right and then you've got mm -hmm. ipfs alongside it what do you think yeah I dig it. Um, yeah, I definitely, uh, I definitely dig it, man. And the fact that it can just be an old laptop, I think, is, is uh, fantastic. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I would definitely, definitely but, recommend. But if, uh, but if you, yeah, go ahead. but if you, but but if you wanted to make this one step more complicated, okay, this isn't easy, but it it it's ideal. You implement a IPFS cluster, and what this does is that. I enroll a node in a cluster. Then whenever I upload to the cluster, all the nodes that are enrolled to that cluster will automatically pin that file. Mm. Which means that if you were like a, vi a big video producer and you wanted to make all of your shows snappy and ready to be viewed whenever you push them up to IPFS, you could have your fans running IP, these children of your cluster, right? Mm. And then when you publish, it gets downloaded to their systems first, and then it helps seed your other people who don't 
uh, don't have notes. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely does. So you've got your own distribution network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I like it. I like it. Um, no, I, I, I know there'd been, there'd been a lot of work. Uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes and also out, out in front of the scenes too. I know Ernie Hancock's, um, you know, active in a lot of these, uh, in a lot of these things. Um, and it's, it's, it's great to see so much progress. I mean, um, I, I talked about it with Brian Sovereign a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> but, uh, just thinking about, um, like Jitsi, like, uh, back in 2015 when I first started using Jitsi, um, like, yeah, there's a manual step for setting up the encryption. It wasn't the, it wasn't the easiest thing. You had to download a client. Um, wasn't, wasn't super user-friendly. Wasn't super crisp. Mm. Um, now it's, it's, you know, it's great. Just pops up in, in whatever browser and no, no, you know, installation necessary. Um, super slick. Um, and then, uh, the ghost phones, um, like I couldn't even imagine, you know, like five years ago, privacy phones, it was like, it was based, I, I didn't see another solution in that area. I'd like it. I, 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 I didn't have like the, I, or at least I didn't think I had like the technical expertise, um, or the time to, to deal with it. But now like, um, these ghost phones, um, they're so cheap, like just 250 bucks for, for a damn phone. And, uh, like it's, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a, a privacy based phone with, with, it's not spying on you. And, uh, you've got a lot, you've got that open source freedom outside of, uh, you know, Apple out, outside of Apple and, uh, I guess even just, you know, lockdown Android. So, um, it's crazy to see the progress. So that's a pix that's a pixel mm -hmm. that's pixel based, right? Yeah. Pix uh, pixel we, three. We bought one yeah. of those for our. Yeah, we bought one of those for our U.S. office, and we're really liking it. Um, I, I've been thinking to get one here, uh, but I just haven't. Uh, <laughs> I've been budgeting for the apocalypse, so. <laughs> no, I get uh, so I. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk. I'll mention this to you too, just because I I would I want I, I would want to know this if I didn't know it. Um, but, uh, um, the listeners have, have, have mm -hmm. heard a number of times, but, um, so I've got, I've got my, my white ghost, um, which is like, I, I have, I have a number, number that's associated with my, you know, my first realm name, um, for telegram and signal and things. Right. So like, I, mm -hmm. I was, I have to have that. I'm going to keep that number right. for now. So like, but if I'm going to have that, that number, like it might as well be on like the most secure phone possible. So I have this one, um, that's connected to that, but I also have my, my, uh, my black ghost, which, um is uh there's a website called silent.link and for you can either you can just get data um like mobile data um paid for with bitcoin or lightning network um or via lightning network um or you can mm -hmm. get like a us or uk identity um quote unquote identity which is an actual phone number with incoming um text and voice like for for like signal two factor authentication I like to set up a like a anonymous phone number mm -hmm. with Bitcoin, so that's possible too. Like with, wow. with those phones, is you just it's it's super easy. It took like five minutes. You just it's just an eSIM card that you scan. You just send the Bitcoin, scan, and you, that's got, you got a number. Yeah, it's 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 nuts. Yeah. It, you got uh, you got any other information on that one? Um, it's silent dot link is the is the website. I can I can definitely yeah I can okay. definitely. Um, oh. which, yeah, but it's like 60 bucks in Bitcoin is, was all it was at US, USD. That's so cool. it's nothing for a year. Cool. Cool. Nice. And I, oh, nice. Cool. I'll look into that. Thank you. <laughs> yes. No problem. Um, like I said, if I was, uh, if I didn't know about it, I'd want to know about it. So I'm making sure to tell people, um, and you can pay on lightning. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yep. For sure. Oh, now that's another thing I think we should be encouraging is people to set up lightning uh, nodes. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely, definitely agree with that. Definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, I, I just actually interviewed, I guess it was, when was it? Um, whatever, whatever day, oh, Saturday. Um, I, was, I talked to this guy about, uh, you know, b about actually mining. Um, so, um, we're going to, I'm going to, I'm mm -hmm. hoping to get like a kind of like the distributed VPN, um, you know, setup thing, um, like a distributed, you know, Pazni and Bitcoin mining operation. Um, so yeah, I'm with you. Not only note like, uh, the Bitcoin full nodes, great, you know, lightning nodes, great. Um, but, uh, like mining, 
um, not only is it just like smart to stack sats, but um, like the innovation in the area in the in the area is just incredible. People are like getting paid to heat their house um, by Bitcoin mining because they're <laughs> just reuse, they're they're just running ventilation ducts oh, that- to the miners. So like they're heating their house with it and they're making Bitcoin for doing it. It's like the innovation is it's incredible. So like we need to be venturing into all these areas. That's cool. As far as I'm and concerned. And you know, <laughs> that's one other thing that I've one other thing I've been involved in uh is we do a cryptocurrency uh mastermind group. It's two hours a week. Uh we do it Monday evening and Friday evening. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And we're talking about the markets, but we're also talking about the tech. So that's been another thing that I've been like really involved in for the last year. Uh, so I'd be definitely interested in alternative things like heating your house from crypto mining. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Because, yeah. you know, the, the mining ratios are through the roof right now. I mean, it, even though the market's fallen off, uh, crypto hash rates are ascending. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's true. And I don't know, I guess I, I'm, I'm, re- I'm realizing that and a lot of people are, too. Like there's there's only so many there's only so much Bitcoin that's going to be out there. So like. Um, the smart thing to do is to acquire as much of it as you possibly can. Um, so mining is just a, like any mm-hmm. way you can get KYC free sats um, is good. So like mining is a great way to do that. Right. So like, right. um, mm-hmm. so that's, that's, that's one thing. And then it's, yeah, it's also that um, if you have like cheap electricity where you are, um, then yeah, you might as well have a rig going. Um, it's kind of the conclusion I'm, I'm kind of getting closer to, but yeah. Well, you know, the, the one thing that I found interesting is that back in 2021, you remember China said no more domestic mining of Bitcoin, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, well there's a bit of a backstory to that. All the way back in 2019, okay, I was talking to a group about building uh, some different unique cryptocurrency products. And I happened to meet a group here in, in Southeast Asia that was like really deep into, uh, stellar development, which is for exchanges. And they also did a lot of Ethereum development. And in this meeting, the guy is like, oh yeah, you know, the Chinese came here and they're buying up space at every hydroelectric dam in the country. And they're, they're renting it to mine Bitcoin. <laughs> of course they are. So these, these guys were already anticipating that they would be booted out of China for mining. And they were setting up agreements with other countries to do mining outside of China. So anyone who says, oh, the Chinese don't mine Bitcoin anymore. Oh, yes, they do. It's just that they've anonymized it in other countries that have cheap energy sources. Yeah. So that drop off that happened in, say, um, June or July, yeah, about June to July of last year. It's all it's all been recovered. It, it's all back. So not the crypto's not dead. It, it's it's definitely here to stay. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh that's that's definitely true. That's definitely true. Um so um I guess uh just another kind of general question here. We've we've been talking a lot about uh like uh, IPFS being, you know, a really incredible solution, the future for the infrastructure of the of the second realm per se. Um but uh what other what, is there anything else um I guess in the past couple of years that uh um that's been, you know, uh, been, you know, developed upon or an idea that you've come, that you've come across um in the digital second realm that could help people help uh, you you know, know, help individuals uh you know help individuals in the digital second realm you know monero uh and type of privacy coins i think are going to be important of course we know bitcoin is pseudonymous so it's not really anonymous 
uh, we can we can try to minimize the amount of information that's known about it, but it's really not anonymous. So we should be looking at other technologies. The Monero is an old type of technology, but it's established. What I've been looking into are things based off of Zcash. So there was that, um, it was pretty you know, popular there for a while. It was uh, a pirate chain. But I'm looking at groups outside of pirate chain like Hushed. Have, have you heard of Hushed? Um, I don't think so, no. Uh, Hushed is uh, supposedly it's the team or some of the team that wrote Pirate Chain that had an internal disagreement with the Pirate Chain people. And they went off and have done their own thing, which will have a, a private e distributed exchange. Hmm. And I, I think I think we should be looking not only at privacy coins, but we should also be looking at distributed exchanges. So you're familiar with Solana? Um, I've heard of it. Yeah, I've seen I've seen it on I've, I've seen that on crypto Twitter. I haven't, I haven't looked into it at all. Uh, you should uh, it, not because it's the be all and end all of distributed exchanges, but because actually it's one of the first groups that pulled off having successful distributed exchanges. So they, they were actually performing really, really, really well uh, last year uh, that they just were like really like they're like in the top 10 uh, of performing cryptos. Uh, but I think what's more important is the idea of a distributed exchange and how you could be hosting a node on an exchange. Not only hosting, say, a lightning node for, uh, pri uh, for you know, bulk uh, micropayments in Bitcoin, but also helping people be able to trade uh, tokens without uh, KYC. True. Yeah, because I, you know, true anonymity is going to have to come through mass, not just through cryptography, but through mass uh, adoption. So the more people that use it, the more difficult it is to figure out who's who. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's true. And another thing we need to do is we need to be replacing Tor with our own networks. We, we shouldn't be depending on Tor. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's an interesting point because, uh, that's another thing. So like these, the, the ghost phones, um, they've got the always on VPN function, but they also have, um, Orbot is on there, which, um, routes all app and mm -hmm. all app traffic through Tor. Um, so I guess, um, do you, uh, do you think that's just a, um, like, uh, um, what's the, what's the practical, I guess the, like if what's the solution to it then i guess is if you could provide more information on that I'd well be the, the solution well the solution as i see it is more exit nodes okay uh because the real vulnerability in uh tor is the exit node uh that what was it five six eight years ago uh they they admitted that they had the NSA had 30,000 exit <laughs> nodes yeah. it controlled. Well, what we need are 30 million exit nodes, and we need to have a network different than the one that, uh, that Tor controls. Cause I, you know, it, the, I've heard people talk about the code inside Tor and they say it's horrible. I think it's deliberately horrible. <laughs> mm. They don't want us to have our own network. Yeah. So we need to have our own network. Okay. So that's, that's fair. So, so I guess, um, I mean, cause the, the thing I like about the freedom boxes and I'm guessing the power boxes, similar ideas where a lot of these things are like one click installs and like, basically you can just click to run and they run. Yes. Um, so like you could probably like what, what's to, what's to say that you couldn't have, um, um, 
you couldn't have like us so, like each one of these pirate boxes and freedom boxes also be a tour exit node um and, and do all these other things too um i don't know if that's feasible or not but yep. yeah it could be no it's feasible as long as it's configured appropriately right and the the greatest concern that people have had to being an exit node is that it kind of like they say well there's a responsibility when you're an exit node right because mm -hmm. you're you're actually putting yourself out as an exit point for someone else mm -hmm. yeah so the if there this is why you need so many exit nodes because it, it then becomes completely meaningless that something happened on your exit node mm -hmm. it's like well how do i know right uh true mm. And also, I, I think that uh, we need to be uh, providing, well, that's really just the same thing as IPFS. We need to be providing redundancy of information. Uh, and we also need to be providing things offline because I think that uh, that's going to be our last line of defense. Uh, like I told, told Ernest the last time I had an, an interview with Ernest, uh, it, it, I'm at the point now where if you really, really, really need the information, make sure it's printed off. <laughs> yeah. Because the future doesn't really seem all that stable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it would be better to err to that side. Yeah, that's true. So, so one of the functions of the Pasnia library is, is what I'm calling it is like, obviously like a digital archive with, you know, good homesteading guides and manuals and like all sorts of information, you know, occult books, anything that, anything that's, you know, can be put on, that'll be put on there. Um, but what I also want to have is since there's Pas Pasnia is all, all over the world, um, have like physical libraries too, where, um, you know, this is down the road. I don't see it happening in, in, in the near future, but, um, eventually start like physically archiving this stuff too. Um, like, yeah, actually, like, like you said, actually printing it out and having copies, um, you know, everywhere, um, and have our own little, uh, I guess, uh, you know, our decentralized, decentralized library of Alexandria per se. Um, it's kind of a cool idea. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I had looked many years ago into uh, how to archive large amounts of data on paper, and there are there are methods of taking digital data and turning it into printouts that could be scanned back in with a scanner in the future. So that's something else to think about. Interesting. Yeah. Nice, nice. Well, I definitely, I wasn't, uh, I don't know, I wasn't planning on going there today, but I, I appreciate it. That's uh, that's all really, really great stuff. Um, but we've been going for, for about an hour here and uh, should, uh, I guess, start to start to um, wrap up here, I guess. Were there any other any other uh, projects sure. or tech that, that you're interested in for, um, you know, uh, digital self-liberation that uh, you'd like to mention before we, before we wrap up? Let's see. You've given me a really good opportunity to to dump what's on my mind. So that cool. that's all I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah. Right on. Awesome. Awesome. Because I've mentioned perfect. all the big all the big ones. Yeah. Yeah. No. There's there's a lot to there's definitely a lot to ponder. Um. A lot to uh. A lot to implement. Um. So I I I'll be getting back. <clears throat> I'll be getting back my freedom box from Jamin. Um. Here hopefully in the next week or two. And um, I'll start to, to tool around with that and actually get to see, because um, I have to use something. I can I can I can you know look at pictures and kind of read about about it, but I gotta actually use it um, to 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 get a feel for it first. So um, there's gonna be a, you know a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things moving forward, um, for sure. At least in that realm. And I know the the Pirate Box Avenue. I've, I've I'm in the uh, the Telegram group for that. So it's good to see good to see all the progress taking place there. Um, yeah, lots of. Uh, Lots of lots of lots of good developments, but yeah, um, I, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, re really, the only obstacle there is just getting more people to to use it. Yeah, I know that they've talked a lot about moving websites to IPFS, and I I just think we need to reformulate the way we deal with 
content. Uh, we're playing presently with uh, publishing small, uh, like single page HTMLs to IPFS, but I think it might be smarter to just publish uh, data packets to IPFS. And then you could have pieces of readers that could then go out and represent that data. Uh, that may be a better way to do it. Uh, but just getting the network booted is the way you got to start. It's let the presentation stuff happen later. That, that'll that be taken care of. Right. Right. Yeah, well said. Very good. Very good. So, um, yeah, I guess... Uh, um, Last thing, uh, anything you'd like to plug or, or uh, let the listeners know about, tell them, tell them where they can you know, sign up for content safe if they're content creators well, or, or, or whatever else you'd like to plug? Yeah, you know, come, if you're a content creator, uh, come and take a look at us uh, at contentsafe.co. Uh, we have a special premiere program that you could avail of uh, in which you can get a lifetime uh, of our service for a special price. We can talk about that if you contact me. And I'd also recommend everybody take a look at uh, Richard Grove's uh, autonomy class. Uh, I know I'm a graduate from there. And uh, not only is Rich a great source of information, but you, you meet a lot of great people at autonomy. So I, I'd like to plug them. Right on. And hopefully I get to talk to you more in the future. Uh, I, there's a lot of stuff that, uh, we overlap with. And I, I, I just have to say, I really appreciate your consistency in continuing to pursue Vanu. Uh, I think that Rayo had a really great uh, approach. And the more I look at the political world, the more I think he was right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, man. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, I don't know. It's a lot easier than survival society life. So, um, yeah, there's, 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 there was never, never yeah. really a choice per se, but, um, yeah, man, it's, it's been great, great chatting. Um, yeah, let's not let it be, uh, you know, a couple of years, however, however long it's been, um, since last time, uh, we chatted here on Vanu, but, uh, um, yeah, we'll, we'll make it shorter, shorter, uh, next time, but, um, anything else before I let you go, Matthew? No, I'm good, man. Have a good evening. Right on. Thanks. All right, guys, and there you have it, uh, Matthew Raymer uh, from Anomalous Design and ContentSafe.co. Uh, please do check out his work, uh, especially if you're a content creator. Uh, he's doing some really, really important, uh, incredible work uh, in that realm. Uh, VaniPodcast.com is the website for all things Vanu. Uh, check out Liberty Type Publications for books on self-liberation, strategy guides, anarchist agorist fiction, and uh, now privacy tools. Uh, ghost pads and ghost phones are both available uh, to ship right now, uh, so please do check them out at libertyunderattack.com. <clears throat> uh, finally, please check out paznia.com uh, to learn uh, more about the Second Realm Network that we're building. Uh, the Free Republic, the first free country in existence right now. Uh, in essence, we're rebuilding the survival society uh, in the Second Realm, only built upon a foundation of peace, truth, and voluntarism, not the deception, manipulation, and outright violence uh, found in the First Realm. Uh, the 2021-2022 Stakeholder Bulletin uh, is linked at the top of the page, too, uh, if you'd like something more wordy and uh, in-depth. Uh, anyway, thanks so much for your time today, and uh, always remember, Vanu is yours for the making, and the Second Realm is yours for the building. Cheers. 2048, the second volume in the Brushfire Thriller series, takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the War of Ideas took place, the creation of second realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished through the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the Freedom Cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy 
who had been van nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the State Zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They're up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state, a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the trio, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the trio pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Liberty Attack Publications, share your story, find your freedom. Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with, with these, you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with, with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. You know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point, if you can't communicate without being monitored, it basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. LibertyUnderAttack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom.